Good morning from the land down under, brothers and sisters. Um, please come on in once you get this notification. And uh, I've got uh, some more. Um, I had another God dream. Uh, and I'm wondering, is that there she is, my dear sister Paulette? God bless you, sister. Uh, everyone, please um, pray for dear sister Paulette. She has been feeling uh, less than well lately, but we want to encourage her and to lift her as well as all of our brothers and sisters in Christ because the time of the rapture of the bride is so close. That I mean, I, I can't even calculate just how close this is, uh, but uh, but but let's do that. God bless you all as you come in. I've had, uh, you know, I keep saying this, but there just keeps to keeps these these situations, or should I say, confirmations that keep coming. And I had two very, very unusual, uh, uh, very unusual God dreams this morning, early, uh, early this morning. Um, I it, it is quite. Um, I, I'm, I'm having, I'm fighting to get the, the right words because it appeared to me on its surface that these two God dreams, first God dream, rapture of the bride and the consummation at the wedding, followed by another dream in which it looks that the Antichrist is uh, preparing to be revealed. And, and then the uh, the wake up and the physical showing of the rapture to me. And I want to go ahead and present all of that to you so that, you know, it will be that encouragement that's going to focus you, especially at this time right now. Um, let me just go ahead and let's start with a prayer. Uh, and then what we're going to do is I'm going to discuss the God dreams first, and then I'm going to do what I discussed, I thought I, thought I might do previously. In my last message, I did a, a deep dive into being born of God or begotten of God. And if you haven't seen that message, I think it is very uplifting and uh, hopefully very encouraging. And at the same time, will give you the chance to search yourself and to find where you might be in that rubric, if you will. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. Please do that. But what we're going to follow up, because uh, I said that there's this, um, I, I guess, two types of views the view of being born of God and the view of being adopted by God. And I am of the very strong opinion uh, based on the word of God, uh, as I covered this uh, well, I covered a lot of scripture this last time, we're gonna cover a lot of scripture this time in where adopting uh, adoption does not mean what we think it means that it actually should more properly be defined as inheritance. We're going to go into that. It's a very deep study. And uh, also, I think it's going to be quite encouraging as well. Let's start with a prayer. Abba, our dear heavenly Father, you are so glorious and so worthy to be praised. There is none like you. 
And, and we thank you for all that you do in our lives, for all of creation, for everything that sings and praises and lifts you up for all that you have done. But most importantly, your son Jesus, whom you gave for us, that we might be able to be reconciled to you. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? So we just thank you for that. And Jesus, we want to express our love and adoration to you. And we are so looking forward to your coming. We are so expectant of your return in the air for us. And I'm asking for you to just, just to build that anticipation, hopeful expectation, joyous expectation in our hearts, almost to and including overflowing that we can't contain it all and just praise you in, in, in this anticipation for your coming for your bride and that you might also, Abba, draw those in this last and final moments before Jesus calls us up in the sky that these last few members might be seated in their place in the member of the bride. I, I say that and I look forward to it now. Holy Spirit, I'm asking for you to anoint these words that, that it's going to just raise the, the joy. It's, it's really going to be edifying to our brothers and sisters and that it will, you know, just, uh, uh, it just raise the interest of those that might be coming by and they, they might see the truth of it and that they might give their hearts to you, Lord Jesus, that they might believe in you with saving faith, and that we pray this all in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and I see the messages, of course, on the chat, and I know I am so ready. I'm so ready for Jesus to call us up. And I know you are too, brothers and sisters. But I'm telling you, it's going to happen so soon, so soon now. And I'm thinking in minutes, not hours. And, and, and when I say that, I am being tongue in cheek, okay? Uh, hello to everyone. Please come on in and, uh, and join us. Um, we are that close and and look, I, along with many other watchmen and women are seeing this time, this moment as being like no other, like no other. That's all I'm gonna say. It's like no other like it. And it is so, incredibly pointing, all of these things pointing to rapture of the bride, rapture of the bride, rapture of the bride. And I think that's that's what has been shown to, uh, shown at, at least to me in, in, in the ways that Abba has been revealing them to me and then for me to then reveal them to you. Well, let me tell you, what I dreamt of last night, or should I say this morning. Now for me, it's, it's important for you to understand that right now it is April the 9th here in Melbourne, Australia. And so I get to, and, and maybe this is a reason for this because I get to give you this message before it's April the 9th in, uh, the, uh, in the U.S. and the northern part of the world, right? Uh, maybe, maybe there's a reason behind that. In this first dream, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details because I just, I just want to, uh, to be able to, because there was a, a lot of this that was so directly personal uh, to me. And so I, I, I don't want to cover that. And, and many of these things, as though uh, many of you who have had God dreams like this, you know what I mean. 
right? That, that there's just some that's that's just for you personally, but then there's other parts that is meant to be shared. And that's what I'm talking about here. In my first dream, I appeared in this top of this building. And, uh, and I knew what that represented. And there were a group of people and everyone was excited and, and, and bustling around the activity and the joy in the air was just so high. And, uh, and I was able to see my, uh, my uh, dear departed wife, uh, Denise. Now, I want to say something right here. I knew that what this represented was not my wife. It represented a bride and uh, it represented my first love, which is Jesus, okay? So I'm not saying that my wife is Jesus. So please don't try to confuse that. So what I'm trying to say is that there, she was symbolically representing a bride and a groom getting married because in this, in this dream, we were coming together. It is like it has been a long time for us apart, which it has physically. But what I'm saying is there's the spiritual application here. And in that spiritual application, I recognized that we were about to be married. And, and, and not at that particular moment. And she was dressed in white in this beautiful white right and uh and 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 with these beautiful patterns and stuff on her clothing now that would make more sense from my standpoint as as a male uh, even though i've had the dreams where i was dressed in a white robe it didn't mean like a bridal robe it was the same type of white robe that everyone, including Jesus, was wearing. Jesus, however, had this gold band uh, on his robe. And, uh, and, but the rest of the people, all this beautiful pure white robes, and, and I was wearing it too. I actually saw it as it appeared, okay? And so in this instance, I recognized that it was the preparation for the consummation that was just about to take place. And just as that happens, and I recognize this, and my joy was just over the top, then that dream stops. And then uh, what happens, of course, I had uh, awakened at that particular moment and I, I was just trying to figure out, you know, like, wow, that's, that's pretty strong. And uh, uh, I end up, of course, uh, eventually going back to sleep. And then I have another dream. And this dream is completely different. And in this dream, I'm, I'm like a, uh, an observer. But what I'm observing now is something, I'm not at the top of this building that was representative of heaven. Now I'm on the earth and I can see these things taking place. There was some activity that was going on, but I recognized it involved media, excuse me, and it involved a lot of people that were preparing things behind the scenes. And in this preparation behind the scenes, I know that there, there's this person, right? And this person 
uh, that is about to be revealed in this, uh, there's going to be this big uh, uh, kind of like a, a news reveal. And we're here in this building and in this building in front, I can see where it is. And guess who this person that is going to be revealed is in my dream, Barack Obama. Now, I, I have never kind of said anything ab about anything as far as this goes. So that was just kind of, uh, that was kind of strange for me. I do know that what that represented uh, was the soon revealing of the Antichrist. Now, am I saying that Barack Obama is the Antichrist? No, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm saying that I understood that's where that idea came from. Why? Because when I was uh, back in law school, uh, I had a, uh, a professor that, uh, that was just very dear to me and to many of the law school students. And he had done a paper that he had asked me to review these years ago in which he had stated at this time, now he's, what I am saying is it represented that the Antichrist was about to be revealed. And so all of these things were happening then behind the scenes. And I'm looking up at, at, at this place where this, this whole big news, world news reveal is supposed to take place. And there are nine chairs. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, the chairs looked like little... Uh, you know, kind of that, like those chairs that you had when you were in school, those little plastic uh, kind of chairs. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure exactly what that meant, but I think that the chairs were, and they were for, they were reserved for certain people. And those certain people uh, were the, uh, the nine other, so there's, there's supposed to be 10 kings is what we're told in Revelation, and they are going to be controlling the world. And, uh, my thought had always been that, uh, uh, Mr. Obama would actually be not necessarily, I didn't believe that he would be the Antichrist. I thought that he could possibly be one of the 10 kings because I just felt that the Antichrist is going to be far more persuasive and those types of things that, that, might, uh, that might be the case. And if so, what that meant from my standpoint is that here's seating for all of those 10 kings, one for uh, Barack and nine others for the other nine. So I think that, that so what all that meant to me was, and, and, and once I realized that, and then there were other people, and I saw there was this one uh, a person that was handing out roles uh, and or positions. So this person was going to do this thing. This person was going to do that thing. And there were a handful of specific roles that were going to uh, uh, play out in this revealing. And, uh, and I was thinking like, I've already got my role, but it's not here. And, uh, and so, because again, I'm the observer. And, uh, and so I'm just thinking that what we have here is that I'm just, I'm just thinking, here's the, the whole thing. There's the rapture of the bride. 
the, the wedding, the, the consummation of that wedding. And then at the same time, what is happening? There's the, uh, then the second dream, meaning what happens next after that is the preparation or the revealing of the Antichrist and the 10 world rulers that are going to be revealed after that moment. And after I have this, oh my goodness, I'm just, I'm just amazed. At the end of this second dream, after I know that everybody in their particular group or they have their particular role, and, uh, and I, uh, I believe that my role or my group is as part of the bride of Christ, then that scene goes black, like, almost like a scene change in a movie. So that's what happened between the first one, then, then black scene change, then the second one, and then black. And then while this is black, then I hear Jesus loudly and I know it's Jesus, and I hear his voice, and he says, wake up, oh, and bang, whoa, I woke up immediately, and I, 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 I was shocked, it was just like, it was loud and very abrupt, and I, I, I was jolted awake, and, and I went, what, 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 and I immediately looked at the clock because now I'm like sitting up in bed, right? And I went, oh my. And I grab my phone and I take the snapshot and got to show you what the time was that I woke up. Or should I say, when Jesus said, wake up. Seven to six. Now this is actually six twenty-seven, right? So seven twenty-six harpazo. And now there's a reason why you can see when you look at this. Now that's what you can see. Now take a look again. You can see Sunday, April the ninth, six twenty-seven, or in reverse, seven twenty-six, or that's our rapture, right? And I, my heart was just pounding, pounding. I was like, oh, oh, oh. And, and, and I'm trying to think, uh, oh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's about to happen. It's about to happen. And just as I get my hands on that, I get my mind wrapped around. That's what this whole presentation is. And the reason why Jesus told me like that is an example of how quickly we are going to be changed and how quickly we are going to be up there. The bride is going to be up there that fast. Wake up! Bang! And what's very interesting is why he used why he used the term wake up. Now he obviously he did it so that I could then notice what was what was on the clock, right? But I'm also trying to think like that's going to be very interesting how that relates then to the parable of the 10 bridesmaids, right? Now if any one of you have seen this before, uh, seen my message before. If you haven't seen my message on the 10 bridesmaids, I encourage you to look at that because the, the summary is the bride is with the bridegroom, right? And it says, then the, 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 then it says, then the cry went out, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, right? And that's spoken to, and it says, to the bridesmaids who were all asleep. And they awoke, right, when they hear that. 
and they start uh, trimming their lamps and you know what else goes on from there. But the bride is already with the bridegroom. The bridesmaids are not the bride. They are the bride's companions, right? I encourage you to look at that and you're going to see. So anyway, that's what I said. Just immediately, this is what happens, right? Not one minute goes by after I'm just like, I'm, I'm really trying to reconcile this. And then Holy Spirit says, Wayne, check your, your YouTube studio. Okay, so I've got this app, my YouTube studio that's on my uh, on my phone. And that's how I can keep track of whether there are messages that come in. It lists things like, depending upon where you are, uh, about how many subscribers that you have and, uh, and uh, you know, what, uh, which particular videos are, uh, are, are doing better than others or what, what's the highest rating, that kind of thing, right? all your analytics. And I was uh, just prompted by Holy Spirit to immediately go to that. Again, my mind is still reeling. It's still reeling. But then I looked at my YouTube studio and I opened it up to this front, uh, this uh, initial page. And then my eyes, I'm just like, ho, oh, ho. Oh. Again, okay, brothers and sisters, I'm going to show you this again. And what my eyes came to right at the beginning, I want you to see, I printed this out in color and uh, I've highlighted it now because I want you to be able to take a quick snapshot of this. Uh, and this is my YouTube thing right here at the top. I don't need to show the whole thing, but take a snapshot of that. All right. Now let's take a look at this at the moment. You will notice that at the top, I've got a red and then the little orange there at 629. Okay. So that just shows you, yes, it was just two minutes after I had uh, taken this other one, after Jesus said to wake up. And then you notice we are the overcomers. And then what does it say? Total subscribers, eight, six, two, seven, or just like it showed in the other one here, seven, two, six, harpazo. And, and the number eight. Now I want you to see, because my eyes also caught this next, you will see that I did this diagonal and I colored it in because we've got the watch time seven. And then right in the middle, it says rapture of the bride only. Then we've got the two out of there. And then down at the bottom, because you see, I actually used a, a straight rule so you can see it was actually in this line, right? All right. So uh, you can see, I want you to see how it's highlighted. Seven, two, six. Harpazo again. Now, why I, uh, I actually did this like this, you can see that there are uh, three lines and that I've connected them all with the middle one saying, rapture of the bride only. Now, what was interesting is if you recall from my very previous message, my previous God dream, uh, that, the, that I had this other dream where there were steps and there were steps, little, each little block of three steps and each little block was set upon another one. Three steps, three steps, three steps, three steps, 20 of them. Now in this God dream, that 20 was the one that went up to the clouds and it was right there at the base of, so here's the clouds, right? These white fluffy clouds. 
And the 20th one is right there at the base of these clouds. And uh, Jesus is telling me that that relates to 20. And then you've got the 20 and the three. So it's 20, 23. That is when this occurs. That, uh, and so there are other things taken out of this. There's the number 20. And then there's the number three. So the number 20 in Strong's represents exuberant, ecstatic, rapturous joy, right? Which is what's going to happen for those that are raptured. And then the number three on the other side means mourning. And, uh, and so what that is, that shows you that's what's going to happen to those that are left behind. When I say mourning, it's M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. They are going to be in grief. Now, that's very interesting when you look at that. So there's the, the those that are go up. We take the steps up. There we're in the clouds. Now, it's not in heaven. It's there in the clouds. Why? Because that's where we are going to meet Jesus at the Harpazo. 726. So I want to bring you back to this uh, YouTube studio uh, snapshot. This diagonal one where you've got the three lines that represented the block of three steps, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? So that then harkens back or acts as another confirmation of these 23 steps, or 23 blocks of steps, I should say, are, let me try that again. These blocks of three steps times 20, okay? Or 60 total steps. Uh, I don't think that it had anything to do with the 60 necessarily. I think that it was strictly to show me the 20 and the three. And so those, those steps are four the rapture of the bride. Okay, do you understand that? And uh, and so I'm thinking, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So Jesus is revealing, I believe, that this truly is how close we are to the rapture of the bride. And that's what I'm saying. I'm still just... And I, I'm still thinking it's like, because that was Jesus. That was Jesus. That wasn't Holy Spirit. That wasn't uh, Abba Father. That was Jesus that did that. Why? Because Jesus is the one that's going to call us up. And, and it's that close, brothers and sisters. It's that close. Well, let me just kind of show you this. And, uh, and as I was coming again, I decided I've, I've, got, I've got to tell our brothers and sisters. I've got to tell our brothers and sisters. And I also then had to have a word, a deep study in the word to go along with this so that we can be ready or you can determine if you are ready, right? And so I am just about to hit start on the live stream and guess what time pops up on my computer? And I went, oh, yeah, sweet. This is exactly it. This is exactly it. So you can see 1111, right? I want you to see that. <laughs> so, and what does that 1111 mean? Because after... The harpod, so that's when the judgment is going to fall on those that are on the earth. So everything that we see, that's I, that just laid out so very, very well. Brothers and sisters, oh, family of God, we are about, about to have a wedding. And I am so excited. 
and I know many of you are too. And if you're not, get excited because there is not going to be a party like this in all of creation. I'm telling you that. All right. So let's then go ahead um, and let's talk about, let's switch this now. Oh, yes. Let's talk about being born of God. And let's continue on to what I was doing before. Now, in this last message, as I uh, mentioned about being born of or adopted. Oh, thank you, Abba. Um, by uh, by God. And here was the thing. That was, that was my thesis was that we are born, begotten of God, and, uh, and that we are not adopted. We are not adopted. I, and it always had me that, the, and, and we're going to explain this very deeply. So I wanted to cover just in the last message, because there was so much to be able to show you that we are begotten of God. When we are born again, we are born of God. And so that's that's how you become a member of the family. You are begotten of God, okay? It's his spirit, his sperma, right? And that's 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 what it is. He fathers his children and we are born. But that is different from the special relationship that the only begotten son, Jesus, shares because he shares the very essence of the father as a member of the Trinity. You understand? All right. So let's go here and discuss. And one of the reasons now this is this is not in any way uh, to be disparaging about adoption. I, I think it is such a wonderful thing uh, for those that, you know, uh, for children to to be adopted in the family, but I want to start with this uh, this this premise. First off, I want you to understand that the word adoption does not even appear in the Old Testament at all. Now, does the principle of adoption appear? Oh, yes. Absolutely. We see that in numerous times. You, 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 for example, Moses was adopted by the uh, Pharaoh's daughter and, you know, the, those types of things. It, there's many instances where we can see where adoption actually is taking place. But there is a reason why there is no word in the Holy Scripture for adoption. And that is because we are born of God. We're not adopted by God. So uh, let's discuss this and let's go in here. All right. So, uh, and, and I'm um, taking this, I, I've covered part of this before, but we're going to go into these deep questions. So I'm quite certain that the Bible does not say we are adopted, as I mentioned. It does say, as I covered in the last mission, uh, message, we are born of God. Now, many commentators seem awfully confused about this, and that's why, uh, because when they're reading the English translation of a Greek document written in a different culture, uh, and that you can see how that could cause some issues, right? Translators have used the word adoption to translate the word heriothesia, okay? And, uh, but they should have used some other English word because that's not what the Greek word means, okay? Now, before there's all kinds of clicks and messages, that's what it says. If you look it up in Strong's and, and that types of thing, that's what he has as the definition. I got you, I grant you that. But hear me out on this. 
I think it, people are able of making mistakes or to be incomplete or to mistranslate for various reasons, right? And I believe this is one of those. And I'm hoping that we're going to clear up this issue a little more, okay? It says, if any single thing is clear in the New Testament, it is this. Verily I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now that is John 3, 3. Entrance into the kingdom of the family to the brotherhood of believers is by birth not by adoption. So I understand what we, when we look at what we understand in the Western cultures today, what adoption is, is you've got someone from another family that is taken just to be in, uh, another person is taking care of them in their family. But they're not from that same family. I saw someone uh, had just put up in the chat uh, talking about the DNA. We share when you're born when you're born of God, you share the DNA of God. Do you understand? That's what it is. You are part of the family, born into the family, not adopted. Okay. All right. So, what does the Bible say about adoption? Now, there's quite a few specific references to adoption in English translations of the Bible, and in combination, it may seem as if or like that they're actually referring to God adopting people. So let me give you examples of this because I'm not trying to hide anything here, but we're going to go in here and we're going to, we're going to parse this out. This is a very important issue. I see it. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, that's Romans 8.15. Here's another one uh, that's always pointed to. Galatians 4, verses 5 and 6. To redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. All right? Now, what we know is that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, that's Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. Oh, thank you, Allah. All right. So, you know, you think like, wow, why do we even question this? It seems pretty convincing, right? That it sounds precisely that's what Paul is telling us, that God is a, in the adoption business. He's, he's adopting people, right? Uh, you're adopted and you're adopted. And do you want to be adopted? Yes, everybody's adopted. No, that's not what it is. It's not adoption at all. Let's find out specifically what he's talking about. So besides the obvious contradictions between this and the theological imperative of the new birth, why right? it says you must be born again. How can you be born again, but you're adopted as well, okay? There are other hints that this word, heriothesia, translated as adoption, cannot really mean adoption. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this, right? Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That's Romans 8.23. So what was that? We who have the first fruits of the Spirit are waiting for the adoption? That's a bit jarring to say the least, or it should be if you really kind of think about it for a minute. So in fact, we saw in Galatians 4, 5, and 6, Galatians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, above, which makes it very clear 
that in the present tense, we are sons. Why would a son be waiting for an option? Okay, uh, so I want you to hold on to that, but that's not all. Here's another quandary. My brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. That's Romans 9, verses 3 through 5. Oh dear, the adoption has always, along with the glory, the covenants, the law, the promises, etc., have been a provision for the Israelites. How can we reconcile that with the rest of the New Testament in which the Jews must be born again? So we really see that we have a problem here. The problem does not lie with the author of these words, of course, but with the reader. The problem is, is that we don't understand the word heliothesia, okay? So let's start and follow me here with the presumption that heliothesia does not mean adoption, okay? And I'm going to show you what it does. It's fair at this point to demand I uh, propose to do with this problem. If the word heliothesia does not mean adoption, well, then what does it mean, right? So what meaning can we insert instead so that the result is something sensible and likely to represent the ideas of Paul who wrote the text? As I mentioned in my previous message and I alluded to, the word heliothesia means inheritance, okay? Now, that's there's not one individual word that's going to work. And yes, I know that we have another word for inheritance, but bear with me for just a moment, okay? It's, it's not that it actually means the inheritance, it means it conveys the idea of coming into an inheritance. Do you understand? All right. So let's just first insert that idea into uh, the uh, whatever, wherever we see that word heliothesia, we're going to use that uh, inheritance in there and we're going to see, reread that again, right? And we're going to see if it fits or not. So let's first go back to Romans 8, 15. And let's read that with the substituted word there for heliothesia. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of inheritance, the spirit which indicates and guarantees an inheritance because of which we cry out, Abba, Father. Hmm? What about uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21 and 22? Okay, we're going to compare that. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Does that seem to fit? I think so. Next, Galatians 4, verses 5 and 6, and we're going to use the inheritance substitution again. To redeem those who are, were under the law, that we might receive the inheritance as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Well, okay. So you, I'm hoping that you see that that that, that tweaks it quite uh, a little bit. All right. So previously it sounded like we were sons because of the huiothesia, but now it appears that we receive the huiothesia because we are sons, right? And that should hopefully make a lot more sense to you. Okay. 
Now let's go on and we're going to address Ephesians verses one, four, and five, excuse me, Ephesians one verses four and five. So let's go ahead and substitute once again that inheritance. So he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to an inheritance as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Again, rather than the huelthesia causing the sonship, it is the sonship that results in an inheritance falling due. Do you understand? We are made sons by Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, and in him we have an inheritance. I hope that that becomes more clear to you. Uh, does that sound like Romans 8, verses 16 through 18? Let's read that and see. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, doesn't that seem to fit? Right. Okay. It, it does to me. I'm hoping that it does to you as well. All right. So let's focus one more moment on Romans 8.23. And let's, uh, uh, let's talk about that for just a moment. So that verse says, not only that, but also, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the inheritance, the redemption of our body. Now, what does that sound like? Uh, we, we didn't cover it earlier. We just kind of just went on by it. But uh, Paul actually tells us what the huiothesia really is. It's the redemption of our body. That is part of our inheritance, right? In other words, the resurrection. And that's what we're talking about today. That's what we are expecting because the resurrection of Jesus, that anniversary is about to take place. And hopefully that change in us into that resurrection body, our inheritance, because we are already sons, if you are begotten of God. All right. This is our birthright. You understand that birthright? I'm going to say that again. I'm going to harp on this born of God. If you are born of God, you have certain birthrights as a result of that. So, having been born into God's family, we become heirs to all of the family traits, proclivities, privileges, and assets. God's family has as its most illustrious inheritance the resurrection of the dead, and we are heirs of it. Amen? We will come into our own inheritance at the dawning of the age on the great and glorious day of the resurrection. That is what Paul was saying. Now, let's, let's look at one more verse, okay? Excuse me, just one moment. Ah, thank you, Emma. Finally, we're going to look at Romans 9, verses 3 through 5, okay? My brethren... My countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, for whom the inheritance was intended, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Now, what does that sound like? The Israelites were always supposed to be destined to inherit the kingdom. 
They failed continually, of course, but implicit in the law and the life of God's service and the covenants and the promises was this inheritance as a people. The resurrection of the dead, which stands for the whole concept of the kingdom of God. And I'm hoping that makes a lot of sense to you, brothers and sisters. So what does this ultimately mean? It means that adoption is not a word that should be used in connection with heliothesia. The word has everything to do with the inheritance due to a family member and nothing to do with how one came to be a member of the family. I hope that that is clear. We happen to know how a person becomes a member of God's family, and I've been covering it over and over. It's by birth, right? It, he came to what uh, was his own, and his own people did not accept him. They rejected him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. That's John 1, 1, 1 through 13. John 1, verses 11 through 13. Amen? All right. Now, just to be able to tack on to that, I wanted to take another person's uh, view on this, and this is a person who wrote about this and gives some additional information following this same logical approach, okay? So, uh, and we're just taking it from, uh, from one of those scriptures. I've, I've covered, uh, of course, a lot more, but the question then was raised, does Heliothesia really mean adoption in Galatians 4, verse 5, okay? And in verses 4, uh, excuse me, Galatians 4, verses 5 and 6, we read, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's the King James Version. Heliothesia is rendered here adoption as it is rendered by the KJV on the four other occasions that it occurs in Romans 8.15, Romans 8.23, Romans 9 verse 4, and Ephesians 1 verse 5. Now this person is saying, my concern is with the concept of adoption, which when used naturally, refers to taking another person's son and administratively assuming responsibility for that other person's son so that legally and administratively the son is perceived as one's own. My thousand page Liddell and Scott American edition 1864 has a word listed. Huiotes, the state of a son or sonship, ecclesiastical. The ecclesiastical appears to mean that it is an ecclesiastical quotation, but no more details are given. So presumably, heliothesia cannot mean precisely sonship as such if another word conveys that meaning. But as to heliothesia, Liddell and Scott, the same book, says it is adoption as a son, New Testament. But the only reference to its etymology or usage is in the above New Testament reference, which seems kind of a little circular reasoning, doesn't it? Thayer says that uh, heliotes, uh, 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 adopted son, means... Uh, and gives a Pinder and uh, Heroditus as references. So excuse me, I'm not familiar with that particular reference. Then Liddell and Scott, American 1964, also gives Heliothesius as adopt as a son with the reference Polybius. So 
what he's saying is that with all of these references, they're, they're using two different words to say sonship, to say adoption, and neither is actually precisely either, right? So he's wondering, what is Paul meaning when, he, when they use the term, the translated term there, huiothesia, to be adoption? So the person then that responds says, great question. This word, huiothesia, is indeed only used by Paul in all ancient literature and only five times as stated in the question. Conventional legal adoption was common in Roman times. Several Roman emperors formally adopted heirs. But it appears to me that well-educated Paul could have used the common legal word for adoption, but deliberately chose not to for very good theological reasons, which are subtle. Therefore, huiothesia is used by Paul as a technical term derived etymologically from the idea of placing a son. In my opinion, it might be better translated sonship because the way Paul uses the word. There are almost no legal overtones. Rather, it carries the idea of an attitude of mind and much less of a legal inheritance. My translations used below. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive a spirit or an attitude of slavery again to fear, but you've re received a spirit or an attitude of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. Note that this verse only makes sense as a contrast between two spirits or attitudes as a result of the new birth experienced by a Holy Spirit. He goes on, Romans 8, 23, and not only the creation, but also ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit grown in ourselves inwardly, eagerly expecting sonship, the manumission of our bodies. Note here that sonship is still future and is equated with the change promised in 1 Corinthians 15 of our bodies, just uh, not just the mind. So here again, we're continuing along that same thing. Let's jump to Galatians 4, verse 5. That he might redeem those under the law, that we might receive sonship. W.E. Vine comments that two contrasts are presented. One, between the sonship of the believer and the unoriginated sonship of Christ, and two, between the freedom enjoyed by the believer and bondage, whether of Gentile natural condition or of Israel under the law. Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, for us to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, having destined us to sonship through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. The reason stated for this is stated as verse 6, to provide praise of the glory of his grace by which he favored us in the beloved. Romans 9 verse 4, who are Israelites of whom the sonship and the glory, and the covenants, and the receiving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises. This is discussing a collective agreement with a nation, and not individuals, as is presumably an allusion to Exodus 4, verse 22. The emphasis here is the result of Israel's sonship, and the radical change that this created in Israel. Therefore, I conclude, this person concludes, that Paul's heliothesia is not adoption in the common Roman legal sense, but a placement of us in the position of sons with the change of heart, new attitude, and later new bodies, 
that this involves due to the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit to remake us like Christ and bring glory to him. Now, I'm not saying that I necessarily uh, agree at every point to point with what that particular person says, but you can see how but from both standpoints, we have Paul that is using a technical term that's only used in five instances, only by him, and, uh, and, it, it, and it's just being translated. So he's trying to use a principle out of the Old Testament, relate it to the New Testament, but it requires a word that uh, is then used in Greek and then translated to English. And then, so that nothing then makes sense in that particular regard. So I'm hoping that you can see that the only way that you become a part of the family is by being born of God. And that as a son, then we receive an inheritance as sons, because that's the way inheritance worked. The, uh, the, the firstborn was supposed to actually receive a double inheritance and those types of things. And if, if there were any sons, the inheritance was to go to those sons. That's that's the way that it was determined. If there were no sons, then guess what? The daughter comes into it, right? And they can receive an inheritance that way. But you see the point. That's that's what I'm saying. It's not about you becoming the son. It's about you receiving what a son would be able to receive as a son, right? You're born first by God and then you can receive an inheritance. And what does the Apostle Paul specifically identify or associate with that inheritance? Our resurrected bodies, right? And so, and that is just about what is going to happen for the bride so very soon now. If you don't know that you are a son and you're watching this right now, and you want to be a son. You want to have an inheritance. Right now, you can do that if you don't know Jesus. He wants to bring you into the family, but you can't come into the family if you're not begotten of God, if you're not born again. And that does not mean saying, okay, I believe in Jesus. No, it's, it's not it's not that. It's not printing out a, a form and then ticking the box. That does not make you born again, okay? You do have to be able, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, is a small little snapshot of just what the gospel, the good news, really is. And that is this, that God came down as and became a man in, in Jesus Christ so that he could die on a cross and pay for a sin debt that no one could pay for. I couldn't pay for it. No one that we know of, not any person on this planet can pay for it. That includes you. But you don't have to worry about paying for it because God loved you so much. He still loves you so much that he had Jesus pay that debt for you. And if you accept that debt, because Jesus then, let me just explain it this way. Look, Jesus died on that cross to prove that he was 100% man but then he was buried in the grave and he arose back to life after three days to prove that he was 100% God. And that's what I'm telling you. And that's what this shows you. And if you believe that, believe it in your heart. And that, and that is in the very depths of yourself, not just some mental ascent, but believe it in your heart. I believe that God came down. Jesus, you did that for me. 
and I receive that free gift. I believe it. I believe it with every part of me. I know without a doubt that you did this for me, and I receive it. Cleanse me. Come in. Save me. Say that. Do it now. Do it now. I'm, I'm pleading with you, brothers and sisters, or uh, what will soon to be my brothers and sisters. I'm pleading with you. If you don't do this now and you haven't done it yet, you do not have any time left. And once the bride is raptured up, it will be truly, it will become hell on earth for all of those that are left behind. And But you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Give your life. Receive that free gift. Ask Jesus to come into your life, to fill you with his Holy Spirit, to seal you with that Holy Spirit of promise. Do that now. Amen? And if you've done that, and I pray that you have, if you've done that, tell someone, tell someone, take that next step right now and tell someone, tell someone, go ahead and let us know if you've done that in the comments. Tell a family member, tell someone else, do not keep it to yourself. Because we're told that if you, if, if, you know, if you confess me, Jesus, before men, he will confess you before the Father in heaven. We want that. He wants to confess your name. Do that now. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, one, one, one on the clock. Oh, not surprising. We are about, we are about to go up. We're about to go up, and I am so thankful for it all. I, I, I love you all. I truly do, and I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. And I so look forward to seeing you all in that, at that heavenly wedding, which is about to take place. God bless you all, and I look forward to seeing you in the sky. Listen for Jesus. Listen for the trumpet and listen for your name as he calls you up. God bless you. Maranatha. I'll see you there. Bye-bye.